Chapter 7, Parts 7, 8, and 9 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 7, Part 7, Battle of Plataea. The field on which the fate of Greece was decided is bounded on the north by the river Asopus, on the south by Mount Cithaeron. The town of Plataea stood in the southwest of this space, on the most westerly of six ridges which connect the lower heights of the mountain with the plain. Three roads descended here into Boeotia, on the extreme east the road from Athens to Thebes, in the centre that from Athens to Plataea, on the west that from Megara to Plataea. The Greek army took the most easterly way, which, after a gradual ascent on the Attic side, reaches the fortress of Eleutheri and the pass of the Oak's Heads, and then descends steeply into the Boeotian land. They found when they reached the other side that the road passed through the Persian camp, and they were forced to take up a position at the foot of the pass. Their right wing, consisting of the Spartans and Tegeates, rested on the high bastion of the mountain, which rises above the town of Erythri. Their centre, on lower ground close to the town, and the left wing, where the Athenians and Megarians were posted, was advanced right down to the foot of the descent. Thus the position of the Greeks was astride the road to Thebes. The only assailable point was the left wing, and against it Mardonius sent cavalry under the command of Mecistius. Sore bestead by the darts and arrows of the enemy, and with no cavalry to aid them, the Megarians required succour. Three hundred Athenians, for the Athenians were also on the left wing, went down to the scene of battle, and the fortune of the day was at last changed when the general Mesistius, a conspicuous figure in the fight, fell from his wounded charger. He was slain with difficulty by a spear which pierced his eye, for his armour was impenetrable, and the Persian horsemen, after a furious and fruitless charge to recover the body of their leader, abandoned the attack. The camp of the Persians was filled with loud wailing and lamentation, echoing, says Herodotus, all over Boeotia for the death of Mesistius. But this success was far from dealing any solid advantage to the Greeks or serious injury to their foes. The Persians were well content to remain where they were. Their great hosts still lay north of the Asopus. The Greeks, in order to obtain a better water supply, and knowing that there was no chance that the Persians would attack them in their present position, decided to occupy lower ground in the territory of Plataea. In order to do this, they moved northwestward along the spurs of Cithaeron, past the towns of Erythri and Hisii. To understand the operations which ensued, it is to be observed that the region between Cithaeron and the Asopus falls into two parts, separated by a depression in the ground. The southern part is marked by the six ridges already mentioned, and the streams which divide them, while the northern tract is also hilly, being marked by three ridges between which rivulets flow into the Asopus. Westward the depression opens out into flat land, the only flat land here, which stretches northward from Plataea to the river, and is traversed by the road to Thebes. The Greek army ultimately arranged itself in order of battle between the Theban road and the Moloais, a tributary stream of the Asopus. Their position was marked by the spring of Gargaphia, 
which afforded an abundant supply of fresh water, and the temple of the hero Androcrates. We are told that a dispute arose between the Tegeates and the Athenians for the occupation of the West Wing, and that the Lacedaemonians decided in favour of the Athenians, who, as we have seen, were under the command of Aristides. The Tegeates were stationed next the Lacedaemonians on the right. Pausanias had now lost control of the eastern passes across Mount Cithaeron. The Persian general, as soon as the Greeks had left their first position, promptly occupied the roads and cut off a provision train which was on its way to supply the Greek army. The Greek general hoped every day that the enemy would attack, but Mardonius, apart from cavalry skirmishing, remained persistently on the defensive. It would seem that the Greeks remained about two days inactive in this weak position, harassed by the Persian cavalry, which crossed the river, hovered on the ridges, discharged darts into the camp, and finally succeeded in choking up the waters of the Gargaphia spring. The only course open to the Greeks was to fall back upon the mountain and either take up a position on the ridges between Hisii and Plataea, or seek to regain their former position at the foot of the main pass. For they could not venture to cross the Asopus and brave the Persian cavalry. Pausanias held a council of war, and it was determined that the army should fall back to a position between Hisii and Plataea, and that one division should move up the mountain slope to recover command of the pass from Plataea to Athens. The whole movement was to be carried out at night. Perhaps Pausanias had received information that the Persian commander was growing impatient and was contemplating an attack. In any case, his plan of retreat proved fortunate, and though it was not executed with precision, the Persians, even as at Salamis, were induced to give battle in conditions chosen by their enemy and unfavourable to themselves. We might understand why Mardonius decided to abandon the defensive strategy to which hitherto he had adhered, if we knew something of the intrigues and divisions in the Persian camp. There seems to have been disastrous rivalry between himself and his second-in-command, Artabazus, who in the ensuing battle did simply nothing, and probably desired that Mardonius should not win the glory of victory. A little to the southeast of Plataea, a spur of Cithaeron was enclosed by the two branches of a stream which met again at the foot of the ridge and went by the name of the island. It was arranged that the Athenians should now occupy the centre next the Lacedaemonians, and they were instructed to retreat to this ridge. The scheme was carried out, as it was planned, by the left wing, who took up their post in front of the temple of Hera, which was just outside the walls of Plataea. But the Athenians, for some unexplained reason, failed to obey orders, and remained where they were in a dangerous and isolated position. The Lacedaemonians too seem to have wasted the precious hours of the short night. Their delay is ascribed to the obstinacy of the commander of one of the Spartan divisions, who had not been present at the council of war, and refused to obey the order to retreat. His name was Amomphaeritus. He was a man of blameless valour, and Pausanias could not persuade himself to leave him behind. But the morning was approaching, and at length Pausanias began his march, convinced that his stubborn captain would follow when he found himself deserted. And so it fell out. When they had moved about ten stades, the Spartans saw that Amomphaeritus was coming and waited for him. But the day had dawned. The Persians had perceived that the Greek position was deserted, and Mardonius decided that now was the moment to attack when the forces of the enemy were divided. His cavalry came up and prevented the Lacedaemonians from proceeding. It was on the slopes under Hisii 
near the modern village of Krikuki, that Pausanias was compelled to turn and withstand the Persian horsemen, who was speedily supported by the main body advancing under Mardonius himself. The Persians threw up a light barricade of their wicker shields, from behind which they discharged innumerable arrows. Under this fire the Greeks hesitated, for the victims were unfavourable. At length Pausanias, looking towards the temple of Hera, invoked the goddess, and after his prayer the prophets obtained good omens from the sacrifices. The Lacedaemonians no longer held back. Along with the Tegeates who were with them, they carried the barricade and pressed the Persians backwards towards the temple of Demeter, which stood on a high acclivity above them. In this direction the battle raged hotly, but the discipline of the best spearmen of Greece approved itself brilliantly, and, when Mardonius fell, the battle was decided. The Lacedaemonians and Tegeates had borne the brunt of the day. At the first attack, Pausanias had dispatched a hasty messenger to the Athenians. As they marched to the scene, they were attacked by the Greeks of the left wing of the enemy's army, who effectually hindered them from marching farther. Meanwhile, the tidings had reached the rest of the Greek army at Plataea that a battle was being fought and that Pausanias was winning it. They hastened to the scene, but the action was practically decided before their arrival. Some of them were cut off on the way by Theban cavalry. The defeated host fled back across the Esopus to their fortified camp. The Greeks pursued and stormed it. The tent of Mardonius was plundered by the men of Tegea, who dedicated in the temple of Athena Alea in their city the brass manger of his horses, while his throne with silver feet and his scimitar were kept by the Athenians on the Acropolis, along with the breastplate of Mesistius, as memorials of the fateful day. The body of Mardonius was respected by Pausanias, but it was mysteriously stolen, and none ever knew the hand that buried it. The slain Greek warriors, among whom was the brave Amomphoritus, were buried before the gates of Plataea, and the honour of celebrating their memory by annual sacrifice was assigned to the Plataeans, who also agreed to commemorate the day of the deliverance of Hellas by a feast of freedom every four years. Pausanias called the host together, and in the name of the Spartans and all the confederacy, guaranteed to Plataea political independence and the inviolability of her town and territory. The hour of triumph for Plataea was an hour of humiliation for Thebes. Ten days after the battle, the army advanced against the chief Boeotian city and demanded the surrender of the leaders of the Medizing party. On a refusal, Pausanias laid siege to the place, but presently the leaders were given up by their own wish, for they calculated on escaping punishment by the influence of bribery. But Pausanias caused them to be executed without trial at Corinth. A Theban poet who sympathised with the national effort of Hellas might well feel distressed in soul. The battle had been won simply and solely by the discipline and prowess of the Spartan hoplites. The plans of the exceptionally able commander, who was matched indeed with a commander abler than himself, were frustrated once and again through the want of unity and cohesion in his army, through the want, apparently, of tactical skill, most of all, perhaps, through the half-heartedness of the Athenians. Never do the Athenians appear in such an ill light as in the campaign of Cytheron, and in no case have they exhibited so strikingly their faculty of refashioning history, in no case so successfully imposed their misrepresentations on the faith of posterity. They had no share in the victory, 
but they told the whole story afterwards so as to exalt themselves and to disparage the Spartans. They represented the night movements planned by Pausanias as a retreat before an expected attack of the enemy, and they invented an elaborate tale to explain how the attack came to be expected. Mardonius, they said, growing impatient of the delay, called a council of war, and it was decided to abandon defensive tactics and provoke a battle. Then Alexander of Macedon showed at this critical moment that his real sympathies were with Hellas and not with his barbarian allies. He rode down to the outposts of the Athenians, and, shouting, we must suppose, across the river, revealed the decision of the Persian council of war. Thus made aware of the Persian resolve to risk a battle, the Spartans proposed to the Athenians to change wings, in order that the victors of Marathon might fight with the Persians, whose ways of warfare they had already experienced, while the Spartans themselves could deal better with the Boeotians and other Greeks, with whose methods of fighting they were familiar. The proposal was agreed to, and as day dawned the change was being effected. But the enemy perceived it, and immediately began to make a corresponding change in their own array. Seeing their plan frustrated, the Greeks desisted from completing it, and both the adversaries resumed their original positions. Mardonius then sent a message to the Lacedaemonians, complaining that he had been deeply disappointed in them, for though they had the repute of never fleeing or deserting their post, they had now attempted to place the Athenians in the place of danger. He challenged them to stand forth as champions for the whole Greek host and fight against an equal number of Persians. To this proposal the Spartans made no reply. Then Mardonius began his cavalry operations, which led to the retreat of the Greeks from their second position. The three striking incidents of this malicious tale, the night visit of Alexander, the fruitless attempt of the Spartans to shirk the responsibility of their post on the right wing, the challenge of Mardonius, are all improbable in themselves. But nevertheless, this story was circulated and believed, and has received a sort of consecration in the pages of Herodotus. End of chapter 7, part 7 Chapter 7, part 8, Battle of Mycale and Capture of Sestos the Battle of Cithaeron shares with Salamis the dignity of being decisive battles in the world's history. Pindar links them together as the great triumphs of Sparta and Athens respectively, battles wherein the meads of the bent bows were sore afflicted. Notwithstanding the immense disadvantage of want of cavalry, the Lacedaemonians had turned at Plataea a retreat into a victory. The remarkable feature of the battle was that it was decided by a small part of either army. Sparta and Tegea were the actual victors, and on the Persian side, Artabazus, at the head of 40,000 men, had not entered into the action at all. On the death of Mardonius, that general immediately faced about and began without delay the long march back to the Hellespont. Never again was Persia to make a serious attempt against the liberty of European Greece. A god, said a poet of the day, and the poet was a Theban, turned away the stone of Tantalus imminent above our heads. For the following century and a half, the dealings between Greece and Persia will only affect the western fringe of Asia, and then the balance of power will have so completely shifted that Persia will succumb to a Greek conqueror, and Alexander of Macedon will achieve against the Asiatic monarchy what Xerxes failed to achieve against the free states of Europe. 
one memorial of this victory of europe over asia has survived till today the votive offering which the greeks sent to delphi was a tripod of gold set upon a pillar of three brazen serpents with the names of the greek peoples who offered it inscribed upon the base the pillar still stands in byzantium whither it was transferred after that city had been renamed constantinople by her second founder the immense booty which was found in the persian camp was divided when portions had been set apart for the gods and for the general who had led the greeks to victory the achievement of the hellenic army under mount cithaeron which rescued greek europe from the invader was followed in a few days by an achievement of the hellenic fleet which delivered the asiatic greeks from their master the greek fleet was still at delos we saw that it was the policy of the athenians to remain inactive at sea until a battle had been fought on land for a naval victory would probably have meant the retreat of the spartans from northern greece on the calculation that the enemy would not attack peloponnesus without the cooperation of the fleet but the armament at delos was drawn into action by a message from the samians seeking to join the greek league and begging help against the persian for the persian fleet was at samos and hard by at cape mycale a large persian army including many ionian troops was encamped the samian request was granted leotychidas sailed to the island and on his approach the persian ships withdrew to the shelter of cape mycale and their army the greeks landed attacked carried and burned the enemy's camp their victory was decided by the desertion of the ionians who won their freedom on this memorable day Mycale followed so hard upon Plataea that the belief easily arose that the two victories were won on the same afternoon. There is more to be said for the tradition that as the Athenians and their comrades assailed the entrenchments on the shore of Mycale, the tidings of Plataea reached them and heartened them in their work. The Athenians and Ionians, led by the admiral Xanthippus, followed up the great victory by vigorous action in the Hellespont, while the Peloponnesians, with Leotychidas, content with what they had achieved, returned home. The difference between the Athenian and the Spartan character, between the cautious policy of Sparta and the imperial instinct of Athens, is here distinctly, and it is not too much to say, momentously expressed. The Lacedaemonians were unwilling to concern themselves further with the Greeks of the eastern and northeastern Aegean. The Athenians were both capable of taking a Panhellenic point of view and moved by the impulse to extend their own influence. The strong fortress of Sestos, which stands by the Straits of Heli, was beleaguered and taken and with this event herodotus closes his history of the persian wars the independence of the hellespontine regions was a natural consequence of the victory of mycale but its historical significance lies in the fact that it was accomplished under the auspices of athens the fall of sestos is the beginning of that athenian empire to which Pisistratus and the elder Miltiades had pointed the way. End of chapter 7, part 8 Chapter 7, part 9 Gelone, Tyrant of Syracuse While the Eastern Greeks were securing their future development against the Persian foe, and were affirming their possession of the Aegean waters, the Western Greeks had been called upon to defend themselves against that Asiatic power which had established itself in the Western Mediterranean, and was a constant threat to their existence. 
the greeks had indeed on their side proved a formidable check and hindrance to the expansion of the dominion and trade of carthage the endeavours of this vigorous phoenician state to secure the queenship of the western seas from africa to gaul from the coast of spain to the shores of italy depended largely for their success on her close connection and identity of interests with her sister towns in sicily and secondly on her alliance with the strong pirate power of etruria the friendly phoenician ports of western sicily motia panormus and solus were an indispensable aid for the african city both for the maintenance of her communications with tuscany and for the prosecution of designs upon sardinia and corsica in corsican waters as well as in sicily the phoenician clashed with the greek it was in the first quarter of the sixth century the dorian adventurers from cnidus and rhodes sought to gain a foothold in the barbarian corner of sicily at the very gates of the phoenicians the name of their leader was pentathlus he attempted to plant a settlement on cape lilibium hard by motia a direct menace to the communications between motia and carthage the phoenicians gathered in arms and they were supported by their Illyrian neighbours. The Greeks were defeated, and Pentathlus was slain. It was not the destiny of Lilibium to be the place of a Hellenic city, but long afterwards it was to become illustrious as the site of a Punic stronghold, which would take the place of Motia when Motia herself had been destroyed by a Greek avenger of Pentathlus after their defeat the men of pentathlus casting about for another dwelling-place betook themselves to the volcanic archipelago off the north coast of sicily and founded lipera in the largest of the islands this little state was organized on communistic principles the soil was public property a certain number of the citizens were set apart to till it for the common use the rest were employed in keeping watch and ward on the coasts of their little home against the descents of Tuscan rovers. This system was indeed subsequently modified. The land was portioned out in lots, but was redistributed every twenty years. The attempt of Pentathlus, the occupation of the Lipparian group, the recent settlement of Acragas, pressed upon Carthage the need of stemming the Greek advance. Accordingly, we find her sending an army to Sicily. The commander of this expedition, precursor of many a greater, was Malchus, and it is possible that he was opposed by Phalaris, who established a tyranny at Acragas. There was a long war, of which we know nothing except that the invader was successful, and Greek territory was lost to the Phoenician. In the northern seas, Carthage was also confronted by the Greeks. The Phocians of Massalia planted colonies and won influence on the coast of Spain. We are told that in the days of Cambyses, the Phocians gained repeated victories over the Carthaginians by sea. Moreover, the new Phocian settlement at Alalia in Corsica was a challenge to Carthage in what she regarded as her own domain. But Greek Alalia was short-lived. Carthage and her powerful Etruscan allies nearly annihilated the Phocian fleet, and the crews which escaped were only able to rescue their families and goods. Alalia was deserted. Corsica fell under the power of the Etruscans, and the coasts of Sardinia were gradually appropriated by Carthage. Thus the chance of establishing a chain of Greek settlements between Massalia and Sicily was frustrated. It now remained for Carthage to establish and extend Phoenician power in Sicily. We have seen how Dorius, son of a Spartan king, made an attempt to do somewhat the same thing which the Canadian adventurer had essayed, to gain a footing in Sicily within the Phoenician circle. He too failed, 
but such incidents brought home to Carthage the need of dealing another and a mightier blow at the rival power in Sicily. She was occupied with the conquest of Sardinia and with a Libyan war, and the struggle was postponed. But the hour came at last, and the Carthaginians put forth all their power to annihilate colonial Greece, at the very time when the great king had poured forth the resources of Asia against the mother country. It was, in the first instance, an accident that the two struggles happened at the same moment. The causes which led to the one were independent of the causes which led to the other. But the exact moment chosen by Carthage for her attack upon Sicily was probably determined by the attack of Xerxes upon Greece, and although the two struggles ran each its independent course, there is no reason to question the statement that the courts of Susa and Carthage exchanged messages through the mediation of the Phoenicians, and were conscious of acting in concert against the same enemy. In the second decade of the fifth century, Greek Sicily was dominated by four tyrants. Anaxilas of Regium had made himself master of Zancli, which from this time forward is known as Masana, and he thus controlled both sides of the straits, which he secured against the passage of Etruscan pirates. Tyrillus, his father-in-law, was tyrant of Himera. Over against this family group in the north stood another family group in the south, Gelon of Syracuse and his father-in-law Theron of Acracas. Gelon had been the general of Hippocrates, a tyrant of Gela, who had extended his sway, whether as lord or overlord, over Naxos, Zancli, and other Greek cities, and had aimed at winning Syracuse. Hippocrates had defeated the Syracusans on the banks of the Helorus, and would have seized their city if it had not been for the intervention of Corinth and Corsaira. But Syracuse was forced to cede her dependency Camarina to the victor. Hippocrates died in besieging Hybla, and the men of Gela had no mind to allow his sons to continue their father's tyranny. But Gelon, son of Dinomenes, a general who had often led the cavalry of Gela to victory, espoused the cause of his master's heirs, and as soon as he had gained possession of the city, brushed them aside and took the tyranny for himself. The new lord of Gela achieved what his predecessors had vainly striven to accomplish. The Gamorai, or nobles of Syracuse, had been driven out by the commons, and they appealed to Gelon to restore them. The Syracusan people, unable to resist the forces which Gelon brought against them, made terms with him, and he established his power in Syracuse over oligarchs and democrats alike. It seems probable that Gelon was either at once, or at a later stage of his rule, appointed formally general with full powers. We find his brother Hieron, who succeeded to his position, addressed by the poet Bacchylides as general of the Syracusan horsemen. The tyrant of Gela now abandoned his own city and took up his abode in Syracuse, making it the centre of a dominion which embraced the eastern part of the island. Gela had for a short space enjoyed the rank of the first of Sicilian cities. She now surrendered it to Syracuse, which was marked out by its natural site for strength and domination. Gelon may be called the second founder of Syracuse. He joined the island of Ortigia with the fortified height of Acredina, which looked down upon it. In the course of the sixth century, a mole had been constructed connecting the island with the mainland, so that the city, though it was still called the island, had become strictly a peninsula. Gelon built a wall from the Acredina fort down to the shore of the great harbour. 
thus Acredina and Ortigia, were included within the same circuit of wall. Acredina became part of the city, Ortigia remained the Acropolis. The chief gate of Syracuse was now in the new wall of Gilon, close to the harbour, and near it a new agora was laid out, for the old agora in the island no longer sufficed. Hard by docks were built, for Syracuse was to become a naval power. She was now by far the greatest Greek city in the west. Gilon, belonging to a proud and noble family, sympathized and most willingly consorted with men of his own class, and looked with little favor on the people, whom he described in a famous phrase as a thankless neighbor. He held court at Syracuse like a king, surrounded by men of noble birth. He tolerated the Syracusan commons, he was not unpopular with them, but he showed elsewhere what his genuine feelings were. One of his first needs was to find inhabitants to fill the spaces of his enlarged town. For this purpose he transplanted men on a large scale from other places of his dominions. His own town, Gila, was sacrificed to the new capital, the half of its citizens were removed to Syracuse. Harder was the fate of luckless Camarina, which was now for the second time blotted out from the number of Greek cities. Two generations had hardly passed since she had been swept away by the Syracusan Republic, and now the Syracusan tyrant carried off all the inhabitants and made them burgesses of the ruling state. Megara, the next-door neighbour of Syracuse on the north, and Euboea higher up the coast, also contributed to swell the population of Gilon's capital. Megara became an outpost of Syracuse, while Euboea was so entirely blotted out that its very site is uncertain. But in both these cases the policy of Gilon strikingly displayed the prejudice of his class. He admitted the nobles of Megara and Euboea to Syracusan citizenship, he sold the mass of the commons in the slave market. In abolishing cities and transplanting populations, Gilon set an example which we shall see followed by later tyrants. He also invited new settlers from elder Greece, and he gave the citizenship to ten thousand mercenary soldiers. Gilon was supported in his princely power by his three brothers, Hieron, Polyzalus, and Thasibulus. He entered into close friendship with Theron, his fellow tyrant, who made Acragas in wealth a power second only to Syracuse itself. Theron, like Gilon, was a noble belonging to the family of the Emenids, and his rule was said to have been mild and just. Gilon married Damareta, the daughter of Theron, and Theron married a daughter of Polyzalus. The brilliant lords of Syracuse and Acragas, thus joined by close bonds, were presently associated in the glorious work of delivering Greek Sicily from the terrible danger which was about to come against her from overseas. End of chapter 7, part 9 Recording by Graham Redman Ten and eleven of a history of Greece to the death of Alexander the Great, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. A history of Greece to the death of Alexander the Great, Volume One, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter Seven. Part Ten, The Carthaginian Invasion of Sicily, 
and the battle of Hymera. A quarrel between Theron of Acragus and Tyrillus, tyrant of Hymera, led up to the catastrophe which might easily prove fatal to the freedom of all the Sicilian Greeks. The ruler of Acragus crossed the island and drove Tyrillus out of Hymera. The exiled tyrant in Anaxilus of Regium. But Regium was no match for the combined power of Acragus and Syracuse, and so Tyrillus sought the help of Carthage, the common enemy of all. Carthage was only waiting for the opportunity. She had been making preparations for a descent on Sicily, and the appeal of Tyrillus merely determined the moment and the point of her attack. Tyrillus urging the Phoenician against Hymera plays the same part as Hippias urging the Persian against Athens. But in neither case is a tyrant's fall the cause of the invasion. The motive of the Carthaginian expedition against Sicily at this particular epoch is to be found in a far higher range of politics than the local affairs of Hymera or the interests of a petty despot. There can hardly be a doubt that the great king and the Carthaginian Republic were acting in concert, and that it was deliberately planned to attack, independently but at the same moment, eastern and western Greece. While the galleys of the elder Phoenicia, under their Persian master, sailed to crush the elder Helias, the galleys of the younger Phoenician city would cross over on her own account against the younger Helias. In the Phoenicians of Tyre and Sidon, Xerxes had willing intermediaries to arrange with Carthage the plan of enslaving or annihilating Hellas. The western island mattered little to Xerxes, but it mattered greatly to him that the lord of Syracuse should be hindered from sending a powerful succour in men and ships to the mother country. We have already seen how the mother country sought the help of Gelon, and how the danger of Sicily forced him to refuse. When the preparations were complete, Hamilcar, the Sophit of Carthage, sailed with a large armament, and landed at Panormus, for the call of Terralus determined that the recovery of Hymeria should be the first object. It is said that the army consisted of three hundred thousand men, conveyed by more than two hundred galleys and three thousand transports but we can lay no stress on these figures. From Panormus, this great host moved along the coast to Hymera, accompanied by the warships, and proceeded to besiege the city, which Theron was himself guarding with a large force. The sea camp lay on the low ground between the hill of Hymera and the beach. The land camp stretched along the low hills on the western side of the town. A sally of the besieged resulted in loss, and Theron sent a message to Syracuse to hasten the coming of his son-in-law. With fifty thousand foot-soldiers and five thousand horsemen, Gelon marched to the rescue without delay. He approached the town on the east side, and formed a strong camp on the right bank of the river. The decisive battle was brought about in a strange way, if we can trust the story. Hamilcar determined to enlist the gods of his foes on his own side. He appointed a day for a great sacrifice to Poseidon near the shore of the sea. For this purpose it was needful to have Greeks present, who understood how the sacrifice should be performed. Accordingly Hamilcar wrote to Salinas, which had become a dependency of Carthage, bidding that city send horsemen to the Punic camp by a fixed day. The letter fell into the hands of Gelon, and he conceived a daring stratagem. On the morning of the appointed day, a band of Syracusian horsemen stood at the gate of the sea-camp, professing to be the expected contingent from Salinas. The Carthaginians could not distinguish strangers of Syracuse from strangers of Salinas, and they were admitted without suspicion. They cut down Hamilcar by the altar of Poseidon, and they set fire to the ships. All this was visible from the high parts of the town above them, and men posted their signal to Gelon the success of the plan. 
the Greek commander immediately led his troops round the south side of the city against the land camp of the enemy. There the battle was fought, a long and desperate struggle, in which the scale was finally turned in favour of the Greeks by a body of men which Theron sent round to take the barbarians in the rear. The victory was complete, the great expedition was utterly destroyed, the chief himself was slain. But of the death of that chieftain, the Carthaginians had another and a far grander tale to tell. This tale does not explain how the battle was brought about. It simply gives us a splendid picture. The battle rages from the morning till the late evening, and during that long day Hamilcar stands at the altar of Baal, in his camp by the sea. A great fire devours the burnt offerings to the god, victim after victim, whole bodies of beasts and perhaps of men are flung into the flames and the omens are favourable to carthage but as he is pouring out a drink offering he looks forth and behold his army is put to flight the moment for a supreme sacrifice has come he leaps into the fire and the flames consume him the offering of his life did not retrieve the day but hereafter Hymera was destined to pay a heavy penalty for the death of Hamilcar. The common significance of the battles of Salamis and Hymera, or the repulse of Asia from Europe, was appreciated at the time, and naively expressed, in the fanciful tradition that the two battles were fought on the same day. But Hymera, unlike Salamis, was immediately followed by a treaty of peace. Carthage paid the lord of Syracuse two thousand talents as a war indemnity, but this was a small treasury compared with the booty taken in the camp. Out of a portion of that spoil, a beautiful issue of large silver coins was minted, and called Damaritian, after Gelon's wife, and some pieces of this memorial of the great deliverance of Sicily are preserved. Section 11. Syracuse and Acragas under Hieron and Theron. Theron and Acragas had played an honourable part in the deliverance of Sicily, though it was a part which was second to that of Gelon and Syracuse. Theron survived the victory by eight years, and during that time he was engaged in doing for Acragas what had been already done for Syracuse by his fellow tyrant. The enlargement of the Syracusian and the Acrantinian cities were effected by opposite processes. Syracuse had sprung up a hill. Acragas, which was perched aloft on a height, sprang down the slope. The enlarged city was encompassed by a wall, of which nature had already done half the building. The most striking feature of the new city was a southern wall, stretching between the rivers and lined by a row of temples. Theron laid the foundations of the temples along the wall, but it was not till long after his death that they were completed, and the line of holy building shone forth in all its glory. In all this work, and in the watercourses which he also constructed, Theron had slave labour in abundance, the barbarians who had been captured after the battle of Hymera. Theron placed rescued Hymeria under the government of his son, Thrasidius, who, however, unlike Theron himself, proved an oppressor and was hated by the citizens. Meanwhile Gelon died, and left the fruits of his enterprise and statesmanship to be enjoyed by his brother Heron. While Heron was to have the sovereign power, Gelon decided that Polyzalus, whom he ordered to marry his widow Damaretta, should have the supreme command of the Syracusian army. The idea of this dual system was unwise, and it necessarily led to fraternal discord. Polyzalus was popular at Syracuse, and his double connection with Theron secured him the support of that tyrant. To Heron he seemed a dangerous rival, and in the end he was compelled to seek refuge at Acragas. This led to an open breach between Heron and Theron, but it did not come to actual war and it is said that the lyric poet Simonides, who was a favourite at both courts, acted as peacemaker. War between the two chief cities of Sicily 
did not come till after Theron's death, and then it brought freedom to Acragus. Heron may be said to have completed the work of Hymera by the defeat which he inflicted upon the Etruscans at Syme. Etruscans were the other rival power which, besides the Carthaginians, threatened the greater Greece of the West. The possession of the northern outpost of Hellas on the Italian coast, the colony of Syme, was one of the greatest objects of Etruscan politics. And, three or four years after the accession of Heron, it was pressed hard by a Tuscan squadron. Heron was a statesman of a sufficiently large view to answer the prayer of Syme for help. The Syracusian fleet sailed to the spot and defeated the besiegers. From this time the Etruscan power rapidly declined, and ceased to menace the development of western Greece. From the booty Heron sent a bronzed helmet to Olympia, and this precious memorial of one of the glorious exploits of Greece is now in the great London collection of antiquities. More precious still is the song in which Pindar of Thebes immortalized the victory. It is perhaps from the hymns of Pindar that we win the most lively impression of the wealth and culture of the courts of Sicily in the fifth century. Pindar, like other illustrious poets of the day, Simonides, and Bacchylides, and Aeschylus, visited Sicily to bask in the smiles and receive the gifts of the tyrant. The lord of Syracuse, or king as he aspired to be styled, sent his racehorses and chariots to contend in the great games at Olympia and Delphi, and he employed the most gifted lyric poets to celebrate these victories in lordy odes. Pindar and Bacchylides were sometimes set to celebrate the same victory in rival strains. These poets give us an impression of the luxury and magnificence of the royal courts and the generosity of the royal victors. Syracuse, on whose adornment her tyrants could spend the Punic spoils, and Acragus, fairest of the cities of men, seemed wonderful to the visitors from elder Greece. Yet amid all their own magnificence, and amid their absorbing political activity, the princes of this younger western world coveted above all things that their name should be glorious in the mother country. They still looked to the holy place of Delphi as the central sanctuary of the world, and they enriched it with costly dedications. The golden tripod, which Gelon and his brother dedicated from Punic treasure, became, like the other golden things of Delphi, the loot of robbers. But we are reminded of that fraternal union by a precious bronze charioteer, which was dug up recently in the ruins of the Delphic sanctuary. It was dedicated by Polyzalus, perhaps in honour of a Pythian victory. It were easy to be blinded by the outward show of these princely tyrants, which the genius of Pindar has invested with a certain dignity. But Pindar, himself born of a noble family, cherished the ideas and prejudices of a bygone generation. He belonged to a class. He wrote chiefly for a class whose days were past. Nobles whose sole aim in life was to win victories at the public games. These men were out of sympathy with the new ideas and the political tendencies of their own age. They were belated survivals of an earlier society. Pindar sympathized with them. He liked aristocracies best. He accepted monarchy even in the form of tyranny. But democracy he regarded as the rule of the mob's passions. The despots of Sicily and Cyrene supported the national games of Greece, and that was in truth their great merit in the eyes of the poet. The chariot race, the athletic contests, seen in the midst of a gay crowd, then the choral dance and song in honour of the victory, and the carouse in the hall perhaps of some noble Aegean burgher, these were the delightful things in Hellas, which to Pindar were the breath of life. He was religious to the heart's core, and all these things were invested with the atmosphere of religion. 
but allowing for this, we feel that he takes the games too seriously, and that when Asilus was wrestling with the deep problems of life and death, the day was passed for regarding an Olympian victory as the grandest thing in the world. We must not be beguiled by Pindar's majestic art into ascribing to the tyrants any high moral purpose. It was enough that they should aspire to an Olympian crown, and incur the necessary outlay, and seek immortality from the poet's craft. The poet could hardly dare to demand a higher purpose. Fair as the outside of a Syracusian state might seem to a favoured visitor who was entertained in the tyrant's palace, underneath there was no lack of oppression and suspicion. The system of spies which Heron organised to watch the lives of his private citizens tells its own tale. One of his most despotic acts was his dealing with the city of Caten. He deported all the inhabitants to Leontini, peopled the place with new citizens, and gave the name of Etna. His motive was partially vanity, partially selfish prudence. He aspired to be remembered and worshipped as the founder of a city, and he also intended Etna to be a stronghold of refuge to himself or his dynasty, in case a day of jeopardy should come. His son Denomenes was installed as king of Etna, but the Dorian city of Etna, so cruelly founded, though it was celebrated in lofty praises by Pindar, and had the still higher honour of supplying the motive of a play of Asilis, had but a short duration. It was soon to become Caten again. At Acris, the mild rule of Theron seems to have secured the love and trust of his fellow citizens. But at Himera he showed what a tyrant might do, by slaughtering, without any mercy, those who had showed their discontent at the rule of his son. Neither the Syracusian nor the Acrantine dynasty endured long. After Theron's death, Thrasydeus misruled Acragus, as he had already misruled Hymera. But, for some unknown reason, he had the folly to go to war with Heron, who discomfited him in a hard-fought battle. This defeat led to his fall. Hymera became independent, and Acragus adopted a free constitution. The deliverance of Syracuse came about five years later. When Heron died, his brother Thrasypolis took the reins of government, and, being a less able and dexterous ruler than Heron, he soon excited a revolution by his executions and confiscations. The citizens rose in a mass, and, obtaining help from other Sicilian cities, besieged the tyrant and his mercenaries in Syracuse. He was ultimately forced to surrender, and retire into private life in a foreign land. Thus the tyranny at Syracuse came to an end, and the feast of Eleuthero was founded to preserve the memory of the dawn of freedom. The rule of the despot seems to have wiped out the old feud between the nobles and the commons, but a new strife arose instead. The old citizens, nobles and commons alike, distrusted the new citizens, whom Gelon had gathered together from all quarters. A civil war broke out. For some time the old citizens were excluded from both the island and Acredina. But in the end all the strangers were driven out, and the democracy of Syracuse was securely established. One good thing the tyrants had done. They had obliterated the class distinctions which had existed before them, and thus the cities could now start afresh on the basis of political equality for all. The next half-century was a period of weal and prosperity for the republics of Sicily, especially for the greatest among them, Syracuse and Acragus, and for Silenus, freed from the Phoenician yoke. At Acragus the free people carried to completion the works which their beneficent tyrant had begun. The stately row of temples along the southern wall belongs to this period. It was a grand conception to line the southern wall, the wall most open to the attacks of mortal enemies, with this wonderful series of holy places of the divine protectors of the city. 
It was a conception due, we may believe, in the first instance to Theron, but which the democracy fully entered into and carried out. But her sacred buildings brought less glory to Acragus than the name of the most illustrious of her sons. The poet and philosopher Empedocles was reared in what he describes as the great town above the yellow river of Acragus. He was not only a profound philosopher, an inspired poet, a skilful physician, but he had lent his hand to the reform of the constitution of his city. Unhappily his personality is lost in the dense covert of legends which quickly grew up around him. The true Empedocles, who, banished from his home, died quietly in the Penoponnesus, becomes a seer and magician, who hurled himself into the bowl of Etna, that he might become a god. A god indeed he proclaims himself to be, going about from city to city, crowned with Delphic wreaths, and worshipped by men and women. For a time, indeed, the Siceliots were threatened with a remarkable danger, the revival of the native power of the Cecils. This revival was entirely due to the genius of one man, and the danger disappeared on his death. Giusetius organized a federation of the Cecil towns, and aspired to bring the Greek cities under Cecil rule. He displayed his talent in the foundation of new cities, which survived the failure of his schemes. His first settlement was on the hilltop of Menaeum, overlooking the sacred lake and temple of the Palaci. As his power and ambitions grew, he descended from the hill, and founded Palaci, close to the national sanctuary, to be a political capital of the nation. He captured Etna, gained victory over the Acrogantines and Syracusians, but was subsequently defeated by Syracuse, and on this defeat his followers deserted him, and the fabric which he had reared collapsed. He boldly took refuge himself at the altar in the Syracusian marketplace. His case was debated in the assembly, and, by an act of clemency, which we might hardly expect, he was spared and sent to Corinth. Five years later we find him again in Sicily, engaged in the congenial work of founding a third city, Cale Acte, or Fairshore, on the northern coast, with the approbation of Syracuse. It is uncertain whether he dreamed of repeating his attempt at a national revival, or had become convinced that the fortune of the Sicil lay in the Hellenian nation. His foundations were more abiding than those of Heron. One of them, Minoe, survives to-day. The career of Ducetius exhibited the decision of destiny that the Greek was to predominate in the island of the Sicils. End of chapter 7, parts 10 and 11《12, 13, and 14 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. By John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 7, Parts 12, 13, and 14. Part 12 Religious Movements in the 6th Century. In the latter part of the 6th century, the expansion of the Persian power had suspended a stone of Tantalus over Hellas, and it seemed likely that Greek civilization might be submerged in an Oriental monarchy. We have seen how the Greek generals, Greek spearmen, and Greek seamen averted this calamity. We have now to see how another danger was averted, a danger which, though it is not like the Persian invasion, written large on the face of history, threatened Greece with a no less terrible disaster. This danger lay in the dissemination of a new religion, which, if it had gained the upper hand, as at one time it seemed likely to do, would have pressed with as dead and stifling a weight upon Greece as any Oriental superstition. 
Spiritually, the Greeks might have been annexed to the people of the Orient. The age of Solon witnessed not only a social and political movement among the masses in various parts of Greece, but also an intellectual and spiritual stirring. There was an intellectual dissatisfaction with the theogony of Hesiod as an explanation of the origin of the world, and the natural philosophy of Thales and his successors came into being in Ionia. But there was also a moral dissatisfaction with the tales of religious mythology as they were handed down by the epic bards, and this feeling took the form of interpreting and modifying them so as to make them conform to ethical ideals. The poet Stesichorus was a pioneer in this direction, and it was he who first imported into the legend of the house of Atreus, the murder of Agamemnon by his wife, and the murder of Clytemnestra by her son, the terrible moral significance which Aeschylus and the Attic tragedians afterwards made so familiar. Further than this, men began to feel a craving for an existence after death, and intense curiosity about the world of shades, and a desire for personal contact with the supernatural. Both the scientific and the religious movements have the same object, to solve the mystery of existence. But the religious craving demanded a short road and immediate satisfaction. The craving led to the propagation of a new religion, which began to spread about the middle of the sixth century. We know not where it originally took shape, but Attica became its most active centre, and it was propagated to western Hellas beyond the sea. Based partly on the wild Thracian worship of Dionysus, this religion was called Orphic, from Orpheus, poet and priest, who was supposed to have been born in Thrace, and founded the Bacchic rites, and it exercised a deep influence over not only the people at large, but even the thinkers of Greece. The Orphic teachers elaborated a theology of their own, a special doctrine of the future world, peculiar rites and peculiar rules of conduct. But they took up into their system, so far as possible, the old popular beliefs. The Orphic religion might almost be described as based on three institutions, the worship of Dionysus, the mysteries connected with the gods of the underworld, and the itinerant prophets. But Dionysus, the underworld, and the art of the seer and purifier all acquired new significance in the light of the Orphic theology. It was perhaps as early as the 8th century that the worship of Dionysus was introduced into northern Greece, and various legends record the opposition which was at first offered to the reception of the stranger. His orgies spread especially in Boeotia and Attica, the worshippers gathered at night on the mountains by torchlight, with deerskins on their shoulders and long ivy-wreathed wands in their hands, and danced wildly to the noise of cymbals and flutes. Men and women tore and devoured the limbs of the sacred victims. They desired to fall, and they often fell, especially the women, into a sort of frenzied ecstasy, into which their souls were thought to be in mystic communion with Dionysus. It was probably the influence of the Dionysiac worship that induced the Delphic god to give his oracles through the mouth of a woman cast into a state of divine frenzy. Men could also deal with the supernatural world through the mediation of seers. Wise men and women called Bacchids and Sibyls, attached to no temple or sanctuary, travelled about and made their livelihood by prophesying, purifying and healing. They practised these three arts through their intimacy with the invisible world of spirits, to which the causes of disease and uncleanness were ascribed. Epimenides was one of the most famous and powerful of these wizards. We saw how he was called upon to purify Athens. Mysteries connected with the cult of the deities of the underworld supplied another means of approaching the supernatural. The Homeric bards of Ionia may have lived in a society where life yielded so many pleasures that men could look forward with equanimity and resignation to that colourless existence in the grey kingdom of Persephone which is described in the epics. But the conditions of life were very different in the mother country in the 8th century. The strife for existence was hard, and the Boeotian poet must have echoed the groans of many a wretched white when he cried, 
The earth is full of ills, of ills the sea. It was a time when men were ready to entertain new views of a future world, suggesting hopes that a tolerable existence, unattainable here, might await them there. These new hopes, which begin to take shape in the course of the seventh century, were naturally connected with the religion of the deities of the underworld. In Homer we find Persephone as queen in the realm of the ghosts, but we meet there no hint of a connection between her worship and that of Demeter, the goddess of the fruits of the earth. But as the earth which yields the sustenance of men's life also receives men into her bosom when they die, Demeter and Persephone came to be associated in many local cults throughout Greece, and there grew up the legend of the rape of Persephone, which was specially developed at Eleusis, and was the subject of the Eleusinian hymn to Demeter, composed in the seventh century. At Eleusis this Chthonian cult acquired a peculiar character by the introduction of a new doctrine touching the state of souls in the life beyond the grave. In the days of Eleusinian independence, the kings themselves were the priests of the two goddesses. When Eleusis became part of the Athenian state, the Eleusinian worship was made part of the Athenian state religion. A temple of the two goddesses was built under the Acropolis and called the Eleusinion, and the Eleusinian Mysteries became one of the chief festivals of the Attic year conducted by the king. The Mysteries, which were probably of a very simple nature in the seventh century, were subsequently transformed under Athenian influence. Two points in this transformation are especially to be noted. The old Eleusinian king, Triptolemus, is made more prominent, and is revered as the founder of agriculture, sent abroad by Demeter herself to sow seed and instruct folk in the art. But far more important is the association of the cult of Iacus with the Eleusinian worship. Iacus was a god of the underworld who had a shrine in Athens. In the mysteries he was born to Eleusis and solemnly received there every year. He was originally distinct from the mystic Dionysus, with whom he was afterwards identified. The mysteries seem to have consisted of a representation in dumb show of the story of Persephone and Demeter. Mystic spells were uttered at certain moments in the spectacle, and certain sacred gear was exhibited. There was no explanation of any system of doctrine. The initiated were seers, not hearers. When the scheme of the mysteries was fully developed, the order of the festival, which took place in September, was on this wise. On the first day the cry was heard in the streets of Athens, Seaward, O Mustai, Mustai, to the sea! And the initiated went down to the shore and cleansed themselves in the sea water. Hence the day was called Halade Mustai. The next two days were occupied with offerings and ceremonies at Athens, and on the fourth the image of Iacus was taken forth from his shrine and carried in solemn procession along the sacred way over Mount Aigalius to Eleusis. The Mustai, as they went, sang the song of Iacus, and reached the temple of the goddesses under the Eleusinian Acropolis, late at night by the light of torches. The great day was when they assembled in the hall of initiation, and sat around on the tiers of stone seats. The Hierophant, who always belonged to the Eleusinian royal family of the Eumolpids, displayed the secret things of the worship. Beside him the torch-holder, the herald, and the priest of the altar conducted the mystic ceremonies. The mysteries are mysterious still, so far as most of the details are concerned, yet we may perhaps say that no definite dogma was taught, no systematic interpretation was laid on the legends, but the acts were calculated to arouse men's hopes, mysterious enough to impress their imaginations, and vague enough to suggest to different minds different significances. The rites gave to many an assurance of future weal, and even to harder reasoners a certain sense of possibilities in the unknown and it was believed that the Mustai had an advantage over the uninitiated, not only here but hereafter, an interest, as it were, with the powers of the other world. So it is said in the old Eleusinian hymn, Bliss hath he won who so these things hath seen, among all men upon the earth that go. 
But they to whom those sights have never been unveiled have other dole of weal and woe, even dead, shut fast within the mouldy gloom below. The Eleusinian mysteries became Panhellenic. All Greeks, not impure through any pollution, were welcome to the rites of initiation. Women were not excluded by their sex, nor slaves by their condition. It is probable that the development of the mysteries owed a good deal to the Pisistratids, and the ground plan of the Hall of Ceremonies, which was erected in their time, can be traced at Eleusis. Part 13. Spread of the Orphic Religion The Orphic teachers promulgated a new theory of the creation of the world, a theory which may have derived some suggestions from Babylonia. They taught that time was the original principle, that then ether and chaos came into being, that out of these two elements time formed a silver egg, from which sprang the firstborn of the gods, Phanes, god of light. The development of the world is the self-revelation of Phanes. It was necessary to bring this cosmogony into connection with Greek theology. Accordingly, Zeus swallows Phanes, and thereby becomes the original force from which the world has to be developed anew. The Thracian god Dionysus Zagreus is the son of Zeus and Persephone, and thus closely connected with the underworld. Zeus gives him the kingdom of the universe while he is still a boy, but he is pursued by the Titans, and when, after many escapes, he takes the shape of a bull, he is rent in pieces by them, but Athena saves his heart. Zeus swallows it, and afterwards brings forth the new Dionysus. The Titans, still wet with the blood of their victim, he strikes with lightning, and the race of men springs from their ashes, so that the nature of men is compact of titanic and Dionysiac elements, good and bad. The motive of the myth was to awaken in the human soul a consciousness of its divine origin, and help it on its way back to the divine state to escape from the prison or tomb of the body, to become free from the titanic elements, penalties and purifications are necessary, and the soul has to pass through a cycle of incarnations. In the intervals between these incarnations, which recur at fixed times, the soul exists in the kingdom of Hades. To attain a final deliverance, a man must live ascetically, according to rules which the Orphics prescribed, and be initiated in the orgies of Dionysus. Thus they prescribed abstinence from animal food, and imposed necessary ceremonies of purification. They taught the doctrine of judgment after death, and rewards and punishments in Hades, according to men's deeds in the body. Thus the Orphics reintroduced, as it were, into Greece, the Thracian Dionysus, who seemed almost another god when brought face to face with the Dionysus who had been Hellenized and sobered since his admission into the society of the Greek gods of Olympus. They adopted and developed the ideas of the Eleusinian mysteries, and in a poem on the descent of Orpheus into Hades, they described the geography of the underworld. They also aspired to take the place of the old prophets and purifiers, and they sought out and collected the oracles which those prophets had disseminated. Their doctrines were published in poems which were intended to supersede the theogony of Hesiod, and the surviving fragments of these works show more poetical power than the compositions of the later successors of Homer. The Orphic religion found a welcome at Athens, and was encouraged by Pisistratus and his sons. Onomacritus, one of the most eminent Orphic teachers, reputed the author of a poem on the rites of initiation, won great credit and influence at the court of the tyrants. We saw how he was supposed to have taken part in preparing an edition of Homer, in which it was suspected that he and his collaborators made interpolations, and how another interpolation led to his banishment, when he was detected in making an edition of his own to a collection of ancient oracles, which were ascribed to the mythical poet Musaeus. The Orphic traditions were taken up by a man of genius, Pythagoras of Samos, who went to Italy and settled at Croton, where he was well received. His philosophy had two sides, the philosophic and the religious. He made important discoveries in mathematics and the theory of music. 
he recognized the spherical form of the earth, and his astronomical researches led to a considerable step, taken by his followers, in the direction of the Copernican system, the distinction of real and apparent motions. The Pythagoreans knew that the motion of the sun round the earth was only apparent, but they did not discover the revolution of the earth on its axis. They conceived a fire in the centre of the universe, round which the earth turns in twenty-four hours, the five known planets also revolving round it, and the moon and the sun, in a month and a year respectively. We never see the fire, because we live on the side of the earth which is always turned away from it. The whole world is warmed and lit from that fire, the hearth of the universe. Pythagoras sought to explain the world, spiritual and material, by numbers, and though he could plausibly defend the idea in general, its absurdity was evident when carried out in detail. His great achievement was the creation of mathematical science. At Croton he founded a religious sect or brotherhood, organized according to strict rules. The most important doctrine was the transmigration of souls, and the ascetic mode of life corresponded to that of the Orphic sects. In fact, the Pythagoreans were practically an Orphic community. Their brotherhood, which did not exclude women, obtained adherents not only in Croton, but in the neighbouring cities, and won a decisive political influence in Italiate Greece. But this influence was exerted solely in the interests of oligarchy. It would seem, indeed, that the nobles became members of the religious organisation, in order to use it as an instrument of political power. It was during the ascendancy of the Pythagoreans that a war broke out between Croton and its neighbour Sybaris, which was then subject to a tyranny. The men of Croton harboured the exiles whom Telis, the despot of Sybaris, drove out, and refused his demand for their surrender. Telis led forth a large host, a battle was fought, and the Sybarites were routed. Then the victors captured Sybaris and utterly blotted it out. New cities were to arise near the place. One was for a few months to resume its name. But the old Sybaris, which had become proverbial throughout Greece for its wealth and luxury, disappeared so completely that its exact site is unknown. The destruction of the rival city was the chief exploit of the Pythagorean oligarchy of Croton. But a strong opposition arose in Croton against the government and against the Pythagorean order. Pythagoras himself found it prudent to escape from the struggle by leaving Croton, and he ended his life at Metapontion. The democratic party was led by Chilon, but the Chilonians did not get the upper hand till more than half a century had passed, and the Pythagorean order flourished in Croton and the neighbouring cities. At length a sudden blow dissolved their power. One day forty brethren were assembled at Croton in the house of Mylon. Their opponents set the building on fire, and only two escaped. It was a signal for a general persecution throughout Italy. Everywhere the members of the society were put to death or banished. At the time of the fall of the Pythagoreans, the Orphic religion was no longer a danger to Greece. It was otherwise in the lifetime of Pythagoras himself. Then it seemed as if the Orphic doctrines had been revealed as the salvation which men's minds craved. And if those doctrines had taken firm hold of Greece, all the priesthoods of the national temples would have admitted the new religion, become its ministers, and thereby exercised an enormous sacerdotal power. Nor would the Orphic teachers have failed, if there had not been a powerful antidote to counteract their mysticism. Even as it was, they exercised a permanent influence, stimulating the imaginations of poets like Aeschylus and Pindar, and diffusing a vivid picture of the world of Hades, which has affected all subsequent literature. Part 14. Ionian Reason The antidote to the Orphic religion was the philosophy of Ionia. In Asiatic Greece that religion never took root, and most fortunately the philosophical movement, the separation of science from theology, of cosmogony from theogony, had begun before the Orphic movement was disseminated. Europe is deeply indebted to Ionia for having founded philosophy, 
but that debt is enhanced by the fact that she thereby rescued Greece from the tyranny of a religion interpreted by priests. We have met Thales and Anaximander already. Pythagoras, although he and his followers made important advances in science, threw his weight into the scale of mysticism. Affected by both the religious and the philosophical movements, he sought to combine them, and in such unions the mystic element always wins the preponderance. But there were others who pursued, undistracted, the paths of reason, and among these the most eminent and influential were Xenophanes and Heraclitus. No man was more active in the cause of reason than Xenophanes of Colophon, who, after the Persian subjugation of Ionia, migrated to Elia, where he died in extreme old age. But he spent his long life in wandering about the world, and none saw and heard more of many lands and many men than he. The feeble resistance of Ionia to the invader had disgusted him with the Greeks, and produced a reaction in his mind against their religion and their ideals. His experience of many lands helped him to cast away national prejudices, and he spent his strength in warring against received opinions. In the first place he attacked the orthodox religion, and showed up the irrational side of gods made in the image of men. If oxen, or horses, or lions, he said, had hands to make images of their gods, they would fashion them in the shape of oxen, horses, and lions. In the next place he protested against the accepted teachers of the Greeks, the poets Homer and Hesiod, whom Greece regarded as inspired. All they have taught men, he said, is theft, adultery, and mutual deceit. Again he ridiculed the conventional ideas of Greek life, the ideal, for instance, of the athlete. He deprecated the folly which showed great honours to a victor in a race or a contest. Our wisdom is better than the strength of human animals and horses. He carried about and spread his revolutionary ideas from city to city in the guise of a musician, attended by a slave with a cithern. But he was not merely destructive. He had something to put in the place of the beliefs which he overthrew. He constructed a philosophy of which the first principle was God, not like mortals in either form or mind which he identified with the whole cosmos, and which was thus material, existing in space, and not excluding the existence of particular subordinate gods animating nature. He was also distinguished as a geologist. He drew conclusions from fossils as to the past history of the earth. As a fearless thinker, seeking to break through national prejudices, he is one of the most attractive of the pioneers of Greek thought. But what especially concerns us here is that Xenophanes rejected Orpheus as utterly as he rejected Hesiod. He would have nothing to do with mysticism and divine revelation. He regarded the Orphic priests as impostors, and he inveighed strongly against Pythagoras. We can hardly overvalue his services in thus actively fighting the battle of reason, and diffusing ideas which counteracted not only the comparatively harmless superstitions of the vulgar, but also the more serious and subtle danger of the Orphic religion. Long before he died, Greek philosophy had become a living power, which no religion would stifle, a waxing force which would hinder sacerdotalism from ever turning back the stream of progress. The rationalism of Xenophanes affected Heraclitus of Ephesus a man of very different temper. Heraclitus heartily despised the vulgar. He was an aristocrat in politics, and he wrote in a hard style for the few. In old age he retreated to the woods to end his life, having deposited the book of his philosophy in the temple of Artemis. A man of greater genius than any of the Ionian philosophers who preceded him, he thought out the doctrine of the flux, which exercised an immense influence on his successors. This principle was the constant change in all things. Existence is change. We are and we are not. But the process of change observes a certain law. Nature has her measures, and thus, while he had developed the doctrine of relativity, good and bad, he said, are the same, he had a basis for ethics. 
His influence was both subversive and conservative, according as one took hold of the doctrine of the flux, or the fixed law of the world. The pantheistic principle of Xenophanes was taken up at Elia by Parmenides, who gave it a new metaphysical meaning. He assumed an eternal unchanging being, and treated it with the scientific method which he learnt from the Pythagoreans. One of the most important services of Parmenides and his followers was their argument that sense is deceptive and leads us into self-contradiction. Here, they said, was the capital error of Heraclitus, who founded his system on the senses. With Parmenides and Heraclitus, philosophy, in the strict sense, metaphysics as we call it, was fully founded. We have not to pursue the development here, but we have to realise that the establishment of the study of philosophy was one of the most momentous facts in the history of the Greeks. It meant the triumph of reason over mystery. It led to the discrediting of the Orphic movement. It ensured the free political and social progress of Hellas. A danger averted without noise or bloodshed, not at a single crisis, but in the course of many years, is a danger which soon ceases to be realised, and it is perhaps hard to imagine that in the days of Pisistratus, the religion which was then moving Greece, and especially Attica, bid fair to gain a dominant influence and secure a fatal power for the priests. The Delphic priesthood had, doubtless, an instinct that the propagation of the Orphic doctrines might ultimately redound to its own advantage. Although the new religion had arisen when the aristocracies were passing away and had addressed itself to the masses, it is certain that if it had gained the upper hand, it would have lent itself to the support of aristocracy and tyranny. The tyrants of Athens might have made an Orphic priesthood a useful instrument of terror, and the brotherhood of Pythagoras was an unmistakable lesson to Greece what the predominance of a religious order was likely to mean. We may say with propriety that a great peril was averted from Greece by the healthful influence of the immortal thinkers of Ionia. But this, after all, is only a superficial way of putting the fact. If we look deeper, we see that the victory of philosophy over the doctrines of priests was simply the expression of the Greek spirit, which inevitably sought its highest satisfaction in the full expansion of its own powers in the free light of reason. The sixth century, the most critical period in the mental development of the Greeks, came to be known afterwards as the Age of the Seven Sages. The national instinct for shaping legends chose out a number of men who had made some impression by their justice and prudence, and, regardless of dates, invented an ideal community among them, as if they had formed a sort of college, and brought them into connection with great people like Lydian kings. Periander, the tyrant of Corinth, was curiously added to the list, which included Solon and Thales. To them were attributed wise maxims like, Know thyself, avoid excess, and it is hard to be virtuous. The spirit which the legend describes to these sages, and which the lives of Solon and Pittacus displayed, reflects the wisdom which sought to solve, or rather to evade, the everlasting problems of the discrepancy between man's ideal of justice and the actual ordering of the world, by enjoining a life of moderation. But it is not without significance that when the Orphic agitation had abated, Greece should have enshrined the worldly wisdom of men who stood wholly aloof from mystic excitements and sought for no revelation in the fiction of the Seven Sages. End of Part 14 End of Chapter 7